Hello, everyone. My name is Jennifer Hancock. I am the founder of Humanist Learning Systems, which is the co-sponsor for this event, and also the vice president for the USA chapter of the International Humanistic Management Session uh, Association, excuse me. And I want to welcome you to the session we have today. And I want to introduce my co-host, Elizabeth Castillo. Hi, Elizabeth. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. We're so glad to see you. Um, I'm Elizabeth out in Phoenix, Arizona at Arizona State University, and I'm the secretary of the International Humanistic Management Association US chapter. Great. So our guest today is um, a celebrity of sorts. <laughs> We're very excited to have her. Her name is Dr. Rian Eisler. She is the recipient of the Distinguished Peace Leadership Award earlier given to the Dalai Lama and internationally known for her groundbreaking contributions as a system scientist, futurist, historian. She is author of Chalice and the Blade, now in 57, her in now in its 57th printing um, and 30 foreign editions, The Wealth of Nations, hailed by Nobel Peace Laureate Desmond Tutu as a template for the better world we have been so urgently seeking and nurturing our humanity um, co-authored with Douglas P. Fry. Her writing and her pioneering work offers new perspectives for constructing less violent and more egalitarian gender balanced and sustainable future societies. She is the president of the Center for Partnership Systems, editor-in-chief editor of the Interdisciplinary Journal for Partnership Studies and distinguished professor at Meridian University. Welcome, Rian. Well, it's a pleasure to be with you, and I, I have to uh, I have to sort of smile because everybody uh, has a hard time. It's called the real wealth of nations. Mm -hmm. You know, the wealth of nations, as you said, uh, was actually dismissed. Right. Uh, if you play on that, the book I wrote is called the real wealth of nations. And Sorry about that. <laughs> you no, know, that's quite all right. It it happens. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be with you today. And I, first of all, want to thank all of you for the wonderful questions. Um, we went uh, over them, Jennifer and I, some of them, and um, they're, they're just great. So what I am going to do in the short time that I have is to really start by telling you a little bit about myself, uh, because people always want to know uh, what led me to this multidisciplinary, cross-cultural, uh, you know, really uh, looking at our past, our present, and the possibilities for our future. And you don't just get up one day after you wake up and do the breakfast dishes and say, I'm going to start this, you know, uh, very different study. Um, my passion, and I have a lot of passion for this work, as those of you familiar with my books and my and, and talks and what have you know, uh, is very much rooted in my own early childhood as a refugee child from Nazi Europe. And uh, those experiences, Crystal Knight, uh, escaping with my parents uh, in the middle of the night, uh, watching the Gestapo break into our home and take my father away, which my mother, through what I today call spiritual courage, standing up uh, to injustice out of love, uh, actually got him back. Of course, some money passed hands eventually. Uh, I, I saw violence. I, it, they were very traumatic. Uh, growing up in the industrial slums of Havana, again, another injustice, the enormous differences between haves and have-nots uh, at that time. Um, so I began to ask questions that I'm sure many of you have asked at some point in your lives, does it have to be this way? When we humans have such an enormous capacity for consciousness, for caring, for creativity, why has there been so much insensitivity, cruelty, violence. And it was these questions that my research sought to answer. And my first uh, thing that I've been asked to focus on interventions, and I will really interweave these in a somewhat nonlinear way with telling you a little bit about my work 
uh, I assume that uh, you have at least a glancing acquaintance with it. Um, but the first thing is really changing our consciousness. Uh, you know, Einstein said it very well. Uh, he said that you cannot solve problems with the same consciousness, with the same thinking that created them. So we have to change our story uh, about many things because so many of the stories, as, as you're beginning to, many of you question these stories, are simply false. And my first uh, two books drawing from my research, The Chalice and the Blade, uh, and then also Sacred Pleasure, which the subtitle is Sex, Myth, and the Politics of the Body, uh, really uh, challenge a very pernicious story. The story, well, the caveman cartoons story, you know. Uh, one hand, he's got a club, a weapon. With the other hand, he's dragging a woman by the hair, right? So what does it tell a child before our brains, neuroscience tells us, you know, that our brains are not fully formed and they develop an interaction with our environment, with our experiences, with our observations, especially in the first five years. So much less before critical faculties are formed. Uh, you know, it imprints this story, doesn't it? We must change it because the evidence is very clear that for millennia, as is developed in my most recent uh, work, the uh, book that um, Jennifer mentioned, Nurturing Our Humanity, which came out with Oxford University Press uh, in 2019, we know now uh, that in the foraging societies uh, that we lived in for millennia, uh, well, my co-author whom I invited after I was working on this book for seven years. It takes me a long time to gather all the research for my work. Uh, he calls them the original partnership societies. And he's one of the world, world's experts on foraging societies. And of course, in The Chalice and the Blade, in Sacred Pleasure, that story is massively challenged, as those of you acquainted with, the, with them know. But I'm going to focus with you on language for a moment, because linguistic psychologists have often told us, and we really have to pay attention to this, that the categories provided by a language, they channel our thinking. And this is particularly true of social categories, right, left, religious, secular, Eastern, Western, Northern, Southern. If you really think about it, there have been uh, repressive, violent cultures in every one of these categories. So none of us answer the question of what is the alternative to uh, you know, the kind of system that we're trying to leave behind. None of us, in fact, if you really closely look at these categories, what you see is something that once you become aware of it is shocking that they either marginalize or ignore or consider them naturally, quote, or divinely ordained, subservient, nothing less than the majority of humanity, women and children. I mean, I write of what I call waking up from the domination trance, and I did at one point when I began to realize that in all my years of so-called higher education, there had been hardly anything by, about, or for people like me, women. And of course, children are rarely mentioned also in what we are taught as, quote, important knowledge and truth. I mean, just think of that. So it isn't just our social categories, uh, which then makes it impossible, doesn't it, for us to really think of other alternatives. Think of matriarchy and patriarchy. They're really two sides of, a, of what I call a domination system, aren't they? Either mother's rule or father's rule. There is no alternative. Well, there is. And in my work, what I saw were patterns that transcend these conventional categories, uh, patterns that 
Uh, there were no names for them, social configurations. I called one the domination system and the other one the partnership system. And it's really a scale, a partnership domination scale. And yes, it's a biocultural scale. Um, so I am going to now focus on another intervention with you, um, which is as time went on, I started to really uh, focus more and more and more on, well, how do we change it? How do we get, uh, first of all, aware of the domination heritage that is in so many of our institutions, so many of the stories in our language, et cetera. And then how do we move from deconstruction to reconstruction? And that I think is fundamental. Uh, yes, we need to understand what it is that stands you know, in our way, but then we also need to understand how to build a more partnership oriented world. And of course that includes business, which takes me to a second area. Uh, I wrote, the book called The Real Wells of Nations. Uh, the subtitle is Creating a Caring Economics. At a time in 2007, when just putting caring and economics in the same sentence, it was a big shock to people. Today, as you are aware, and this is an important partnership trend, we are hearing more and more about caring. Uh, the word caring economy has been co-opted to only mean it, the line between co-option and transformation is a very thin one, uh, to really mean only direct care rather than the larger concept introduced in the real wealth of nations. But we, we're hearing about human infrastructure, another term that I coined. We need new language. This is very important, and I cannot stress it enough. Uh, a colleague of mine calls our conventional right, left, religious, secular, etc., categories weapons of mass distraction because they fragment our consciousness. The real struggle for our future is not between capitalism and socialism, right and left, religious, secular. It's between those of us who want to move to a more equitable, less violent, more caring way of life, and those who uh, really know only two alternatives, you either dominate or you're dominated. Like former President Trump, he said, he said, it's all about domination. For him, there is no partnership alternative. So economics. Uh, the second thing is we have to leave behind, and this is still part of the first intervention, the whole argument between capitalism and socialism. Both capitalism and socialism came out of the 1700s and the 1800s, early, very early industrial times. We are now in the 21st century post-industrial age. So on that count alone, they would be antiquated, wouldn't they? But there is something else, even though both challenged elements that we have you know, from the domination system, which is top-down rule, of course, um, they didn't challenge top-down rule where we all live, in our family, our childhood, our gender relations. And so for them, there was, first of all, there was absolutely nothing. And, and really, if you look at both capitalist and socialist writings about caring for nature, caring for our life support systems. On the contrary, for both Smith and Marx, nature was there to be exploited. As for caring for people, uh, for children, for the elderly, for the sick, that work was in their worldview, which was a domination worldview, even though they were challenging some aspects of it. Uh, for them, that was to be done for free by a woman, in a male controlled household. And even as late as when Marx wrote, in most jurisdictions, a woman, a wife, because most women were wives, 
could not sue herself for injuries negligently inflicted on her. Only her husband could for loss of her services. That's what we're still carrying in this distinction caught that is still taught in our economic schools between so-called productive and so-called reproductive work. Cap both capitalism and socialism are based on a woefully incomplete map of what economics is about. Lead a map that leaves out the three life-sustaining sectors of the economy the natural economy, the volunteer community economy, and the household economy. And I'm really going at the speed of light here. Um, but what can we do? We need to have some tools to change the consciousness. So we at the Center for Partnership Systems have been working on new metrics. Why are metrics so important? Well, we measure what we value and we value what we measure right and look at gdp because it's really funny if it weren't so tragic gdp actually includes as quote productive work activities that harm and take life selling cigarettes the resulting medical costs the resulting funeral costs they are wonderful they make gdp go up a tree, you know, we need trees to breathe, to live. It is only part of GDP once it is dead, once it's a log, once it's been chopped down. So what GDP and most economists talk about as quote externalities is actually life. I mean, think about that for a moment. I mean, we've inherited a crazy, system and in the chalice and the blade i have two chapters called reality stood on its head about the remissing because part of this is remissing changing the story uh changing the consciousness action then follows in fact if you and i'm, I'm going to really close with this you were supposed to tell me jennifer when i'm yeah five minutes so <laughs> All right, but I mean, I sort of know that I'm beginning to run out of time. Um, we need new metrics. We need new tools. Um, one of we, I have identified in my work four cornerstones, and we'll keep going back to those because they're not what's in your media. They're not yet what is in your media, I should say. So this is where you come in to change the conversation. And they are childhood. We know from neuroscience, as I said, that what children experience and observe uh, in their, particularly in their first five years, is fundamental to how our brains develop. And with it, how we think, how we feel, how we act, including how we vote. So this is fundamental partnership trend that we have to support is the trend uh, towards non-violent authoritative rather than violent authoritarian child parenting right and there is a trend in that direction these are fundamental basic trends that we have to support and we have another resource that you can use the Caring and Connected Parenting Guide, uh, which is in both English and Spanish on our website, uh, centerforpartnership.org. You can download it, as I said, for free in both English and Spanish. And it's based on the newest neuroscience. The second cornerstone is gender. And I think that in uh, judging from your questions, many of you, are very aware that gender, which we've been taught is, oh, you know, just a women's issue or just a men's studies issue. No, it is that, of course, but it is a key social and economic issue. We have inherited, as I alluded to, a gendered system of values that is reflected in GDP, 
that is reflected in both capitalist and socialist theory, that is reflected in our business models, that does not, I mean, why do we need new metrics, the social wealth economic indicators, and now the social wealth index that we're working on, condensing and updating, shows the economic value of the most fundamental human work, the work of caring for people starting at birth, the so-called women's work, right? And the work of caring for our natural life support systems. And of course, women, remember, we're supposed to keep a clean and healthy home environment that translates into keeping a clean and healthy planetary environment, caring for nature. So we have to change our economic rules and our structures. And this is where you come in because you are working on that. And of course, uh, the, so that's the third cornerstone, shifting to a caring economics of partnerism, which is detailed in the real wealth of nations. And we're back to story and language as the fourth one. Politics follows all of that. So I'm going to stop. Thank you, Rianne. I wanted to know if you had any last thoughts before we close this up. Um, just any parting, parting words for us. Well, I, I received the Humanist Pioneer Award years ago, and I very much identify as a humanist. Uh, and I would love to see this group really uh, use this, use this, because it is what can make the difference, not just short term. Short term is important. Who we vote for is essential, but long term, long term goals and some of the four cornerstones. Uh, just pay attention to those because all the progressive uh, modern social movements have challenged the same thing, a traditional nomination, whether it was the so-called divinely ordained right of, of kings to rule subjects or of men to rule women and children or of a, quote, superior race uh, to rule, quote, inferior ones, all the way to the environmental movement, but they haven't paid enough attention to the foundations, to these four cornerstones. And so we've had regression after regression. And we've got to stop this through, and the only way to stop it is to pay attention to this, to the foundations and build, shift the foundations from domination to partnership. Thank you so much, Rianne. On behalf of everyone, I thank you for participating and accepting our invitation to talk today. Um, this has been the Humanistic Professionals Lunch and Learn by the International Humanistic Management Association. And we hope you like this enough to join us online and become a member of our association. We do this monthly. Next month, our guest is uh, Joe Sprangle, who will be talking about humanism in the manufacturing sector, how humanism can get applied to hum humanistic manufacturing. So we'll see you there. Thanks so much.